Great. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. This is our uh, presentation on the Get Me a Network feature that was added in the Newton release, which is, um, given we have already released Okada and we're working on Pike, it seems like, I mean, talking about a thing that we released a year ago is sort of odd, but most people are just getting upgraded to Newton, so timing is actually good. Um, I'm Matt Riedemann. I, I am. Go ahead. <laughs> I worked for Huawei on the Nova PTL for the last three releases. And I am Armando Miyacho. I work at Susan now, and I've been the Neutron PTL um, for the Mitaka, Newton, and Locata releases. So today we're going to go over what the rationale for the feature was, basically use cases, what the problem was, what the proposed solution was, the different community effort involved, because this was a couple releases going and a lot of different people involved, different projects between Neutron and Nova, uh, the test methodology, how we came up with doing the testing, the integration testing, uh, possible future enhancements. Uh, Armando is going to attempt a demo, a live demo. And then uh, questions, if anybody has any, hopefully. So let's dive in with the rationale. Um, so you see here on, uh, on the left of the screen a clueless user with a laptop and trying to boot his own first VM in the cloud. And, um, Prior to, to get me a network, um, he would either he or she would either uh, start a VM potentially with uh, no net, no uh, networking at all, or he would have to basically get a good understanding of how Neutron worked and provision um, Neutron uh, networking building blocks in order to provide the VM with uh, a way to, to the cloud or to the internet and to, to, to other cloud resources. So um, in reality, what needed to happen was that again, a cloud user, uh, in order to get networking to their VMs, needed to get uh, to intimate knowledge, networking knowledge, uh, and, and how Neutron worked. Uh, he or she needed to create a logical network for tenant isolation, and on that network you needed to provision an IP space by means of a subnet. And if the, if that network, of, uh, if that VM needed to go out to the internet and, and, and back, you, you needed to create a router, provision the router, attach it to a public external network, and so on and so forth. That obviously led to frustrating users because uh, <laughs> that was obviously a multi-step process. Uh, there ought to be a simple way to do this. So the very high level requirement was how do we take that mess and automate it to make it easy? And that's what Get Me a Network does. The operator performs a one-time setup with some defaults, and then the user gets a network provision when they boot a first VM within their project. And then he's wooting, I guess. I mean, that person does look like you a little bit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't wear a sport coat, though. So the solution with um, on server create, what we basically do is if you don't already have a network available, Nova then works with Neutron to see if there are some re you know, minimum requirements, if we can actually auto-allocate a network topology. If the, user, if the user doesn't have one, then we tell Neutron to create one. Um, any other boot request after this basically gets the same network topology. So this is a one-time only per project unless you delete everything. But it's created the first time, and then after that, Nova will ask Neutron for available networks. It's already there, and we'll reuse it. We should note that this doesn't automatically give you a floating IP, though. There's good reasons for it. We'll, uh, we'll show them in a bit. So that sounds simple enough but it took us about two years to get this done. <laughs> so in this slide, we uh, outline the, the timeline. So this, this uh, you know, we had a proper discussion back in the Vancouver summit in, in 2015. Again, it's about to be two years now. And um, we achieved a rough consensus in the, in the room. Uh, when we went, went back home, we worked on, on the neutron spec and we start, so the, obviously we in that spec outlined um, a couple of strategies, implementation strategies and, and ways to deal with, with the auto-provisioning problem uh, as, as stated in the Vancouver Summit. 
Um, and then implementation, you know, kind of stalled uh, for resource constraints reasons that I'm not going to digress too much in, in uh, you know, right now. And, um, but that said, in the Mitaka time frame, uh, we managed to resume the work and um, achieve um, further consensus with, uh, with the NOVA team and the NOVA mid-cycle that was held in January in 2016 in Bristol. And we were able to complete the feature on the Neutron side in March 2016 in time for uh, uh, you know, the Mitaka official release. At that point, basically, the ball was back into NOVA's court. And we said, you know, now it's your problem. You, you, you get it from, you know, to the finish line. And that's what happened. I mean, uh, so the NOVA team got together, they put together a spec, outlined what the strategy was in order to describe what the user experience needed to be like when dealing with the API as well as the common, you know, the common line. And, you know, Matt uh, put many hours during the weekends and, uh, and, and, uh, and nights and uh, the feature got implemented in time for the Newton release. And throughout the integration testing, we kind of like ran on out a few, a few issues that, um, that were kind of like overlooked on the Newton side, but we managed to, you know, get the, the, the feature um, tested like end to end. I was going to add that. Um during Liberty, there was actually a lot of mailing list discussion about a lot of this. Monty and Jay Pipes specifically had been talking about a lot of the sort of end user requirements for this. So this wasn't, I think it's important to note that this wasn't just Nova developers and Neutron developers saying, hey, we could write a bunch of code to do this thing, and not really knowing if any actual end users care about this or would be using it. It was really driven by um, Mont. We <laughs> At least within Nova, we usually say, well, how would an end user care about this? We'll go to Monty, because Monty's got the shade with right. you know, 50 different public cloud counts. And we say, for the UX on the end user design, what do you want to see out of this? So there was a lot of end user input on how this was done and design going up into the specs. Yeah, and I mean, from, from, a, from a time standpoint, some would argue that actually took quite a long time, you know, roughly two years to get this implemented. And this wasn't like overly controversial. As a matter of fact, you know, when we go into, um, you know, into the neutron, um, like side of uh, side of the house, there was some initial pushback, and actually the pushback was mine because my main concern was, okay, now if you're asking me to do the provisioning of multiple steps at once, you know, atomically and in a, in a potent fashion. Now you're putting an awful lot of, you know, constraints on on the implementation, and potentially you, we may affect the ability for Neutron to 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 cope with load. And I, you know, I was initially like reluctant to the idea of you know, adding that much complexity into the code base. But then, obviously, you know, the, the rationale was there, and we just had to make, sh you know, we just needed to again uh, work hard in order to pull that off. And um, so, okay, I mean, I, I put the, the spec in there for, uh, uh, you know, for reference. Um, but, I mean, even though there was an awful lot of, like, uh, complexity to deal with on, on the neutron side, we were able to rely on, uh, on uh, building blocks that were already available in the neutron uh, system, um, such as subnet pools and, and, external, and, and default external networks. So what, what subnet pools do, uh, if for, for some of you who may not know uh, about them, um, it's a way uh, for the operator to specify a much larger like pool of addresses that can be used to fetch uh, IP ranges from when allocating uh, tenant networking. So rather than uh, force the tenant to come up with its own IP scheme, uh, by means of the default pool, a tenant can say, I want an address out of this pool, and you know, an IP scheme gets generated out from it. Um, so the, the, the workflow, I mean, the, the way we went about implementing this from the neutron side is that then the operator has to come up with a, you know, with an enough uh, large uh, default subnet pool. Uh, they may, you know, be IPv4 as well as IPv6. That he, he or she, you know, is confident that you know it's not going to get exhausted throughout the life of of its cloud. I mean, it, it uh, kind of can. Things get complicated if you get to a point where your your uh, the uh, subnet pool gets exhausted. Then um, you know you, you'll have to uh, massage things <laughs> a, a little bit. Uh, so you end up like marking a, a subnet pool as default again as the 
subnet pool to fetch IP addresses from, uh, you end up choosing a public network, the one that you use in order to allocate your floating IP, uh, your, you know, your, the ones that you're using to get VMs out to the outside world or the internet. You mark that as, as default. Um, and those are basically the two uh, decision points that the, the human being makes on behalf of the neutron deployment so that the neutron deployment, when faced with a request of provisioning a topology on the user's behalf, uh, in Neutron knows you know, what, what uh, resources to use. Uh, during the boot phase, then Neutron simply takes, uh, you know, goes in, in the default subnet pool and uh, pulls up an IP space. It creates a network, a subnet, a router, an uplink, as I showed you in the, in, you know, in the earlier slide, and it returns the network ID to Nova. At that point, Nova has everything it needs to, to do in order to proceed with, you know, with the pool process and, you know, give a VM and a virtual NIC. So on the Nova side, as, as Armando said, at Mataka Neutron delivered their API, they delivered their changes in the Newton release. Nobody had really picked this up, I guess. There wasn't really a... Um, Anybody already planned to work on this? And I think it was just like one day in IRC, we were talking about, well, they've already got this, this API available over in the networking service. What is it going to take to use this thing? And we sort of talked about it for, I don't know, a few minutes. And I thought, this doesn't seem that complicated. I'll start writing a spec. So here's the link to the spec. It's actually, <laughs> it's actually pretty detailed. Um, but I, I generally go overly detailed in my specs. Um, but as I was going through this, there was a lot of the interesting parts of this was when I started looking into, <laughs> when I started looking at the code in Nova um, and how it actually works. Now, the funny thing is we found out that there was this weird case that you can get into where if you don't actually have a network available, Nova doesn't fail. You just get a VM with no address, no, no networking, nothing. And we thought, well, is this a, is this a bug? Shall, you know, should we start failing? If we fail, that would be an API change, so let's not do that. But are there actually use cases for people doing this thing, actually specifically not wanting networking when they create the server? You can attach it later. There's an API in the compute service to attach a network later. But it just seemed weird to us that you would create a VM with no networking to start. So something like that drove a lot of discussion in the mailing list, and how do we handle this? Do we actually specifically say in the API that if you don't want networking, you say that you don't want networking? Um, that drove the, we were thinking about, well, should we make defaults in the API? Should we sort of assume behavior? And we just eventually came to the conclusion that assuming how the user is going to use it is a bad idea. We should just be very explicit and specific in the API. Um, this is another case of, we don't, a lot of the problems that we have is designing things is we don't really know how users are using things. We don't know users are using which APIs and how they're doing them, so we try to be very explicit in this case. Another thing that came up was Nova supports rolling upgrades. So rolling upgrades in Nova means that the control plane can be talking to the prior version of the compute. And since the compute is what's actually allocating the network, when we were doing all of this in the control plane, we needed to know we could be talking to a Mataka compute that has no idea that the user is actually requesting this specific thing. So we had to build that into the code. And there's, Nova actually has some metadata built into it that we know what the versions of the services are, and we can make decisions in the control plane based on what level the compute is. So really, the way this works is you, you don't auto-allocate until all of the computes are upgraded to the level of code that understands this type of request. As I sort of touched on with the, um, the none case is the boot request today takes a dictionary, and it's got a, either a port ID, a network ID, or a fixed IP address, or some sort of crazy combination of all three, which every time I have to look at how this works and what's actually required in different cases, uh, it's just it's confusing. Um, so we were thinking, well, the initial, the initial draft of the spec said, well, we'll just say provide an enumeration for the network ID. And eventually, uh, Kenichi, actually, Kenichi Omichi was reviewing the spec, and he said, what if, what if we just said, you either, if you want the specific stuff, you provide the dictionary as you have before. If you want a specific network or a specific port, you do that. 
if you want the very simple case, we just have an enumeration. You either say, I do want networking automatically created for me, or I don't. And so that's what ended up being in the API. Um, before this microversion, if you don't specify networking, it's automatic. So we still have, we still wanted sort of that same behavior, but the API is explicit. So with this microversion, you still have to specify whether or not you want auto or none. You cannot specify just no networking without providing this network um, key. There was some pushback on that in the development mailing list about this used to just sort of work automatically before, and are we making it more difficult now by making people actually be explicit in the API request? We thought if you're an API user, you are probably being very specific about the stuff that you're doing anyway. So the way that we massaged this a little bit was we said if you're a CLI user, if you're using the command line, you want it to be simple. You want to make sane defaults. So in the CLI, if you don't specify anything, we still default to do auto-allocated networking. Another key thing was that Nova doesn't do retry of this. So when Nova asks Neutron to actually auto-allocate the network topology, if it were to fail for some reason, Nova doesn't retry. And that's really based on trying to make sure that everything is atomic and idempotent over on the Neutron side, which when we get later into the test discussion, that's drove a lot of the test um, methodology. So I've already talked a little bit about the workflow. The workflow is basically, it's a microversion, so anything over 237 to do this. Um, the network's key, that's where I was saying if it used to be, a, it could be a dictionary or it can be an enumeration. If you want auto-allocated networking, you specify network's auto. Uh, Nova will check to see if all the compute services are updated to the latest level to support this. If not, it still goes back to the old behavior, which it won't auto-allocate a network. If there's one available, you'll get it. So it, for anybody that's been used to how this has always worked, it's really no, you don't lose anything. You just don't get the new stuff. Um, Nova API will validate that if there's a network already available to the project, we'll just use it as before. If not, we check to see if the defaults that the operator is supposed to have set up has set them up. If not, then we have to fail the request because we can't, we can't perform it. Down on the compute side, same thing, basically. If there's already a network, if you just created DevStack, DevStack gives you a public network, you just use it, um, no problem. Nova won't tell Neutron to create anything. But if there's not, if there's no networking available to the tenant already, then we ask Neutron to create it. If, that's, if it works, we get the network ID back, we create a port on it. If it fails, we don't retry, because basically this is a global failure. If Neutron isn't set up to handle this, it's not retrying to a different compute isn't gonna work. So we fail and we put the in instance into error state. So the testing, the, uh, going back to the atomic and idempotent nature that we wanted this to be in the neutron side is when we wrote the Tempest test, the none test is easy. You basically just say, I don't want networking, make sure that there's no networking. That's an easy test. The difficult test was making sure when you start out with no network for the project, that one gets created, but just one gets created. And it doesn't fail if multiple requests are coming in. So the key point to this, and I think when I, wrote, when I originally wrote the test, I was creating two servers at once at, at the same time. But that didn't really, there was this weird little edge case where a third server, three servers getting created at the same time was really what made this sort of fall over <laughs> on the original implementation on the Neutron side. Yeah, you did break Neutron, yeah. Yeah, and that cost, like writing all the code was pretty simple once we figured out the design. It was really the testing that was like, oh, look, this three servers, two's okay, three makes it all fall over and start burning. Um, the reason is that the first two servers will come in concurrent and they'll see, Neutron will say, there's no networking for this thing, I'll start creating it. Eventually it figures out, wait a minute, there's only supposed to be one of these, it rolls back the first one. The third server coming in comes in after the first two and then it sees something is getting created, but there's two of them. What am I gonna do? There shouldn't be two of them and that's the whole um, network ambiguous error if you've ever gotten the network ambiguous error booting a server where Nova just throws up its hands and says, I don't know which one to pick. You didn't tell me, I, whatever, I'm gonna fail. Um, so based on these failures, we ended up having, Armando worked on a bunch of 
actually hardening the neutron side of this. I don't know if you want to go into yeah, details. I mean, we ended up basically leveraging um, admin statuses on, uh, on on networks, where when when neutron does the provisioning. Uh, again, since the provisioning actually involves a, a, a number of steps that uh, cannot, you know, for, uh, for a number of reasons ca happen in an atomic fashion uh, because there is backend coordination involved if you're using, uh, you know, different SDN controllers and whatever, um, y you need to basically lay a, a um, atomicity as a semantic on top of the existing plugin API that Neutron implements. And basically we did lever, you know, we did accomplish that by uh, creating, you know, networks in disabled state and turn the, the, the admin state back to, you know, back to enabled once we were happy that only one network was available, was, was, being, was being provisioned. And uh, that was, you know, that, that allowed us to work around this, this particular corner case. And I will say everything in, the, everything in CI is gating on this test. This is not a scenario test. This is not a slow test. This is something gets run on every patch, um, so thousands of times a day. So once we got this worked out, this is actually gating on everything from ever actually merging. So it's pretty solid. Yeah. So you know, once we got to that point, then it's okay. The feature is done, done on the Nova side, on the Neutron side. What's next? And actually, one of the reasons why we're here is, and there is also a forum session about about this that will happen tomorrow. Uh, it's you know, get people interested in this feature, trying it out because it doesn't do every, everything, right? It doesn't address every possible provisioning case that that people may come up with. Uh, in fact. As, as Matt mentioned at the very beginning of this session, we don't auto provision in floating IPs. And the rationale there was okay, uh, if we have like dual stack deployments or we have IPv6 deployments only, actually we don't have floating IPs, or we don't want to get into a situation where you only have IPv4 uh, addressing, you don't want to you know, necessarily allocate floating IPs if a user is not interested in using one ever. Uh, so we kind of like left it aside. Uh, it's enough, you know, enough of a of a step, a simple step that can be left to the end user. Uh, on the other end, we don't allow uh, the the, the um, you know the, the neutron system to figure out which kind of external gateway mode to associate to the router. Uh, a router is also, you can you know can can do as nothing or not, and we use the default, which is uh, as not is enabled by default. At the same time, we don't you know we ex we provision an expli a, a very like ex explicit uh, networking topology, which involves a logical tenant network, which is typically VXLAN, uh, that's uh, backed by a router that's connected to an external network. Uh, what if a system does uh, rely on provider net, pro, you know, provider VLANs alone? Uh, those are not quite um, uh, addressed yet at this moment. So I think you know words uh, can do solely so much. Mm -hmm. So we figured you know uh, we have two minutes left. Let's see. We got only two minutes. Let's see if we can pull that off. So do I have to hold this? Yeah. Right. So what we have here is a dashboard. Let's see if I, I'm still logged in. Oh yay! <laughs> yeah. So. So what I want to do here is show how this works in practice. So I'm going to, I'll try to type very fast. See, so right here we have a router external network associated to the tenant, no demo tenant. And we're going to provision here two servers, and we don't specify any networking. So to be Truth to be told, we started five minutes late. So I think we can perhaps overrun a little bit. But let's see what happens. Uh, so we did, so what I did here, boom. We haven't touched anything except like uh, launching two servers without specifying any networking. What happened in the under, you know, on the back of the screen of the terminal is two auto-allocated networks have been provisioned an IPv4 and an IPv6 network because that's how I configured my dev stack that uh, are connected to the public external network. Now, my VMs should go and get attached to those networks. So it's still taking some time, 
but eventually it should it should do that. And that it's a live demo, so I left to see whether it's gonna work as it expected. We also found out a few hours ago this morning when we talked about this actually when we went through this dry run a couple weeks ago on a hangout. Um, Armando was using the Nova CLI with Nova Boot. Everything worked fine. This morning, um, he was using OpenStack client, and it wasn't auto provisioning the network. And we were trying to figure out, <laughs> you know, are, is your dev stack actually running like you know trunk code, and what could be going wrong with this? And we then I remembered that OpenStack client, the CLI doesn't default to the latest. Of, it doesn't do API version mic, um, negotiation for the CLI, which Nova CLI does. So if you're using OpenStack client, by default, you're not getting the micro version that's going to do this thing automatically. All right. So everything is good. Life is good. The demo is behaving. Let's delete those servers. And and now uh, we want to try a different deployment scenario where let's wait these servers to go away. So again, as, as we've seen right now, uh, the user hasn't done anything uh, except running the server and the networking provisioning as, as done on, on, his, on his or her behalf. Uh, VMs are gone, but what we can do now is that we can use another clever command that was introduced at time in the, in the Mitaka time frame, which is purging the, 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 um, the tenant deployment. So by doing neutron purge, and that's the, you know, the tenant or project ID, uh, what Neutron is going to do is going to wipe out all the networking resources for that tenant. So uh, the task that prior, prior to this command would require the user to script uh, deleting, you know, deleting the networks, the routers, and security groups, and so on and so forth is done at the push of a single button. So you should see that network disappear. Yeah, which so, we had to do that in Tempest, and it was right. It is not fun yeah, to code a, that up. <laughs> it's a client side. It's a client side orchestration. It's not something that actually we have. Actually, there is. There is a, a way to uh, uh, delete the auto, uh, the auto allocated topology in Neutron. So you have an API endpoint that takes the delete verb. Uh, it's just not exposed through the API binding. So if you were to talk directly to the API endpoint, then you know you could do that actually. So that public that, that public network is a router external network created by the admin. So what else I wanted to show you now is to create a shared network. And that's obviously visible to all tenants, and yet boot service on them. And you'd see that actually no tenant networking is provisioned whilst they boot a, com a, a, a server or servers, but the, shared, the network available to that tenant, that the project that is going to be used in order to plug the VM. So you can see, you know, I'm actually going to do that as admin. I'll create a network and uh, you know and, and an IP range, and then I'm gonna flip back to the uh, demo uh, project or tenant, and I'm gonna boot the VM. I'm gonna boot the servers. So let's do that and see what happens. So you'd see now that the shared network gets provisioned under the hood, well, uh, well by by the tenant, and when I boot the server servers, they're gonna plug into the shared network. So give it a sec. It's not a very beefy VM, and it's running on my laptop. Mm. Here you go. They are just plugged. Nothing else is required. So with the 10 seconds we have left, does anybody have one question? You could shout it out, and I could repeat it if. There Chet, maybe? Mark? Well, that, uh, If we could use the mic, uh, or we would just replay the question. I'll just replay it. Yeah. Uh, sure. Do you, does Neutron purge the VMs for security? Is that all networks are only auto creating networks? Is Neutron purge for auto allocated networks no, only or all networks? No, every, every resource provision by the tenant. So anything Neutron finds is owned by the tenant. That's owned by the tenant. And, and correct. So, and the, new, you know, the admin can also go and <laughs> wipe uh, any tenant or project environment that he cares about. Or is pissed off by. <laughs> All right. All right. So I guess that deserves a round of applause. I mean, come on, that's an amazing <laughs> demo. Let them feel. Thank you.
So give it a try. Give us feedback. Again, there is a forum discussion uh, tomorrow. I should have actually added the note here, but I was lazy enough to not do that. And uh, thank you very much for, uh, for coming here and listen to us. Thank you.